Hi guys. It is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous and I do mean over the top beautiful day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here in New York where we have dodged another bullet here in the Finger Lakes. Uh, somehow we have slid into Thursday, September 2nd, 2021, unscathed from uh, our fellow New Yorkers in the big city. Where, how many people, nine people drowning in, uh, in New York City uh, as the 2021 hurricane season bashing New York a lot more than Florida. But anyway, I'm going to let you just go over to the mainstream media for articles on hurricanes in New York. Has that wildfire burned down Tahoe yet? Uh, whatever New Orleans is looking like, all of the other. Uh, so I was thinking about doing a story about how 30% of trees on this planet getting ready to head into oblivion, how the seagrass in Florida being destroyed, maybe this new oil slick uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. But I want to thank uh, alert listener Bjorn on Bjorn Nordstrom for sending me uh, today's, it's good, this is going to be at least three days worth of Chronicles of the Collapse. Oh yeah, before uh, I get into it and after thanking Bajor and I also want to send out a big thank you to Wanda for her very kind joining my Patreon uh, club. I do have a Patreon account. It is a small exclusive club, but if you want to join the very small and exclusive Patreon club here at Collapse Chronicles, I really appreciate that Wanda and also want to send a big thank you out to Gareth. Gareth to his very kind <coughs> PayPal donation this morning. So you can go into the introduction to all of my videos to find out how to support this channel. And I really appreciate the financial support and all of you guys sending me uh, these stories. So anyway, once again, thank you Bajorn uh, for sending me this, well, linking me over to this article I have from some group, MDPI, don't even, never heard of MDPI, have no clue uh, what MDPI stands for, and this is an article the lead author's name is Megan Siebert, S-E-I-B-E-R-T. Not sure who Megan is, but Megan teamed up with ecologist William E. Reese, uh, that's R-E-E-S, from this Canadian ecologist. William Reese, one of my, <clears throat> I think, one of the best uh, interviews I ever had on Collapse Chronicles. Look up that interview with William Reese from a couple of years ago. William understands the situation of the collapse of the planet uh, as well or better than pretty much anyone I have ever met. This man knows what he's talking about, so if he's teaming up with Megan Siebert, I'm assuming Megan does too, but we're going to come back uh, <clears throat> on Sunday and we're going, this is going to be the subject of my doomsday sermon, <clears throat> but for today, just to whet your appetite, we're going to dig deep <clears throat> and read one section out of here, <clears throat> out of this uh, article with the exciting title of Through the Eye of a Needle, an Eco-Heterodox, <clears throat> an Eco-Heterodox Perspective on the Renewable Energy Transition. It's like, uh, I can tell they really worked hard on that, uh, that headline, but basically 
It's just their version of the bright green lies. This is William Reese and Megan Siebert's version. Uh, <clears throat> but we're going to jump down. As I say, Sunday, I'm going to come back and uh, read the whole first part of this. And But we're going to get down uh, way down through after they go through their version of bright green lies talking about how the energy transition from fossil fuels to renewable green energy how the green new deal is a joke as andy the gardener would say it is the single biggest delusion that the clueless morons calling themselves humanity believing in the 21st century. Uh, one more wake-up call that the Green New Deal is not <clears throat> going to save the planet. So down deep, they finally get into the summary of what might actually salvage civilization. And they uh, break it down into there's three things that might actually salvage civilization if, I mean, you know, it's built in. This is once again, a, you know, even William Reese is just making the automatic assumption that we want to salvage civilization. So uh, this is for those people who still want to salvage civilization. Uh, even William Reese has a blind spot, but for those people who actually want to, there's uh, three ways. Uh, there's energy realism. Don't forget the radical societal contraction, the radical societal contraction and transformation. And, of course, part of that, I do not believe it. This might be the most intelligent paper I have heard uh, since I went down this rabbit hole in 2008. We're going to let William and Megan talk about population reduction. Population reduction, uh, one I would say the only way not so much to salvage a civilization, but to salvage a planet. So whether we're talking a civilization or a planet, <clears throat> let's talk about population reduction. Uh, this is <clears throat> the second front in a one Earth living strategy is a global one child fertility standard. I'm going to make one more comment, then I'm going to uh, get back to letting William and Megan talk. The, uh, the second front in a One Earth Living strategy, guys, is a zero child fertility standard. Okay, but that's just me. Uh, we're going to let, so for, for people who want to salvage civilization, okay, the second front after getting realistic about the uh, energy transition in a one earth living strategy is a global one child fertility standard this is needed to reduce the global population down to the one billion or so people that can thrive sustainably in a reasonable material comfort within the constraints of a non-fossil fuel, non-fossil energy future and already much damaged earth. Even a step as seemingly bold as this may be insufficient. Do you think so? Even a step as seemingly bold as a global one-child policy may be insufficient to avoid widespread suffering as such a policy implemented within a decade or two would still leave us with about three billion souls by the end of this century. 
failure to implement a planned, relatively painless population reduction strategy would guarantee a traumatic population crash imposed by nature in a climate-ravaged, fossil energy devoid world. A human population crash imposed by a human compromised environment, not nature, may already be underway. Do you think so? Controversial studies have documented evidence of failing sperm counts and other symptoms of the feminization of males, particularly in Western countries, caused by female hormone mimicking industrial chemical. See? <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> concerns over the restriction. Concerns over the restriction of procreative freedom. Yes, concerns over the restriction of procreative freedom, racism, and physical coercion that dominate much of the present discussion on population reduction must be put into perspective. Population is an ecological issue that, if left unchecked, can have catastrophic consequences. The human population curve over the past 200 years resembles the boom or plague phase of the kind of population outbreak that occurs in non-human species under unusually favorable ecological conditions. In our case, the resource bounty made available by abundant, cheap energy. Plague outbreaks invariably end in collapse under the pressure of social stress or as crucial resources are depleted. And this is really, uh, in my interview with William Reese, this is really what we uh, center on in that hour-long interview, uh, that humanity, that we are in the plague. We are literally in the plague uh, state uh, on the planet. When you go around looking for the plague on this planet, it is not, it is humans. <clears throat> Previous cultures have recognized this fact along with the need for population regulation for thousands of years. A judicious balance between the freedom and well-being of individuals and society involves knowing when to arc nimbly between those poles as circumstances change. There is perhaps no greater rallying cry for the restriction of certain individual freedoms than the imminent threat of global social ecological collapse. Though it hardly seems worth stating, you know, to anybody with a brain, Though it hardly seems worth stating, a universal one-child policy applied globally is not applied globally, is not discriminatory. Here we go with, you know, so many people already would have shut him off calling uh, Bill and, uh, and Megan eugenicist and racist. What they're talking about is what I've been talking about years. It makes no difference. Zero difference. Uh, what color your skin is, what uh, religion you are, whatever. This is a human racist issue. All right. 
Anyway, though it hardly seems worth stating a universal what one child policy applied globally is not discriminatory. Moreover, it is entirely justified when the restoration of ecological integrity for the well being of present and future generations of humans and non humans alike is the motivation. Fortunately, there is a full toolbox of socially just and humane tools for bringing about this necessary population reduction. That some inhumane practices have been used in particular circumstances historically is no reason to ignore the gravity of contemporary overshoot and the ample mechanisms available for sustainable population planning. When it comes to both the environmental and social aspects of overshoot, no other single individual action comes close to being as negatively consequential as having a child. Thank you, Bill and Megan. One more time, breeding. Breeding is the single, uh, the single most planet-eating thing uh, that you can do. That, uh, and, and reducing your family size by one child, it, it, you take all of this other crap that they talk about these individual choices. There is one individual choice you can make. Don't breed. And they're saying stop at one. And of course, some of us would say stop at zero, which is where I stopped at as my own personal sperm count plummeted to zero. Took about 20 minutes to take my sperm count to zero. Anyway, getting back to Bill and Megan, yes, no other single individual action comes close to being as negatively consequential as having a child. We should note that the human population at carrying capacity is a manageable variable whose magnitude will depend in part on society's preferred, preferred material standard of living. This is a finite planet with limited productive capacity. A constant sustainable rate of energy and material throughput will obviously support fewer people at a high average material standard than it will at a lower material standard. Do you think so? We cannot stress enough. We cannot stress enough that a non-fossil energy regime supply cannot support anywhere close to the present human population of nearly 8 billion, this urgently necessitates reducing human numbers as rapidly as possible to avoid unprecedented levels of social unrest and human suffering in coming decades. This flies in the face of mainstream concerns that the failing fertility rate in many particularly high income countries is cause for alarm. And, uh, and then here they go from that solution to the radical societal contraction 
which goes hand in hand with the contraction in the number of humans on this planet. We are a plague on this planet. There is one way to save this planet, whether or not you want to salvage civilization is your own business. There is one way to do it all. We got to get the population of this planet down below one billion people, and we got to do it PDQ. And uh, two ways to do it. You know my choice. Anyway, I got to wrap this up because that was a phone call from a guy on Craigslist. Hopefully that was a phone call now that I'm talking about humans being a plague on the planet. I have to see if I can go, if we're going to go ahead to get a washer and dryer for bugs in a jar farm. Because I am sick and tired of going to the laundromat. Maybe there is a washer and dryer in my future get out there and uh, enjoy being a plague on the planet while well, you still can because there's nine people in New York City who are no longer a plague on this planet. <clears throat> Bye guys. Alright little dog, are we going to Syracuse to buy a washer and dryer? so I don't have to go to a damn laundromat again.